day 740 of the Trump administration gave us a stark picture today and a stark view of the reality of the world we live in. That's because today our top combined intelligence chiefs, the people who define their job as keeping us safe, the directors of national intelligence, the FBI, the CIA, presented their annual worldwide threat assessment to Congress. Serious business. Their assessment of nearly every major threat is vastly different from what we have heard from their boss, our president. This was essentially a public repudiation by his own people of Donald Trump's worldview, in particular, what he has said about Russia, North Korea, Iran, and ISIS. Trump has gone to great lengths to avoid casting Russia and Putin as adversaries, for starters. Here now, a reminder of what he has said about the Kremlin's efforts to interfere in our elections and society and what his intelligence team said today. I have great confidence in my intelligence people, but uh, I will tell you that President Putin was extremely strong and powerful in his denial today. Is Russia still targeting the U.S., Mr. President? Thank Press, you very let's much. Go. Make your way. The Kremlin is stepping up its campaign to divide Western political and security institutions. We expect Russia will continue to wage its information war against democracies and to use social media to attempt to divide our societies. Not only have the Russians uh, continued to do it in 2018, but we've seen indication that they're continuing to adapt their model and that other countries are taking a very interested eye in that approach. Even as the intel chiefs laid out the threat from Russia, today we learned that Trump has apparently had another previously undisclosed private exchange with Vladimir Putin. That's in addition to a similar exchange back in 2017, the summit in Germany, and their one-on-one -on -one in Helsinki. This is from the Financial Times. They're reporting it today, quoting a Russian government official that Trump and Putin talked for about 15 minutes at the last G20 gathering in Argentina and that they discussed a number of foreign policy issues. The paper reports that once again, no translator or note taker from the U.S. team was present and the State Department has declined to discuss any details of the meeting. Well, today, the director of national intelligence was asked about these private meetings. According to press reports, Donald Trump met privately with Vladimir Putin and no one in the U.S. government has the full story about what was discussed. Director Haspel and Director Coates would this put you in a disadvantaged position in terms of understanding Russia's efforts to advance its agenda against the United States? I look forward to uh, uh, discussing that uh, in a closed session. The intel chiefs had sobering assessments of North Korea's intentions toward the U.S. Trump, for his part, expects to hold his second meeting with North Korean dictator Kim Jong-un late next month in a second round of talks aimed at getting rid of nuclear weapons. Again, please note the differences here between Trump and his intelligence community. We have, with North Korea, we have a very good dialogue. I'm going to not go any further than that. I'm just going to say it's very special. We've made a lot of progress that has not been reported by the media, but we have made a lot of progress. North Korea will seek to retain its WMD capabilities and is unlikely to completely give up its nuclear weapons and production capabilities because its leaders ultimately view nuclear weapons as critical to regime survival. The regime is committed to developing a long-range nuclear armed missile that would pose a direct threat uh, to the United States. Another topic now on the threat from ISIS. There was also a big gulf between the view from the West Wing and what we heard today. We have won against ISIS. We've beaten them and we've beaten them badly. It's working out very well, knocking the hell out of ISIS. The group has returned to its guerrilla warfare roots while continuing to plot attacks and direct its supporters worldwide. ISIS is intent on resurging and still commands thousands of fighters in Iraq and Syria. And on Iran, the intel chiefs say Tehran is still abiding by the nuclear deal despite the U.S. withdrawal, even though the president continues to criticize it. What we've done to Iran since I've become president is rather miraculous. 
I ended the horrible, weak Iran nuclear deal. At the moment, technically, they're in compliance, but we do see them debating amongst themselves as they failed to realize the economic benefits they hope for from the deal. Notably absent today, any word from the intel chiefs to back up what the president just addressed the nation about from the Oval Office. First time in his presidency, a crisis at our southern border with Mexico. Remember that? The New York Times reports this about the written report that accompanies their, accompanied their testimony today at the hearing. Quote, notably missing in the written review was evidence that would support building a wall on the southwestern border. The first mention of Mexico and drug cartels was published nearly halfway through the report following a range of more pressing threats. Earlier on this network, the vice chair of the Senate Intel Committee was asked about the disconnect when viewing threats to the U.S. I think you've got the intelligence community giving virtually a unanimous uh, conclusions on some of these key, key areas. And we have, unfortunately, a case where it appears that this president doesn't want to hear the truth or doesn't actually ref reflect the opinions of the intelligence community. And that puts us in a challenging position. Let's bring in our leadoff panel, shall we, for a Tuesday evening. Philip Rucker, Pulitzer Prize winning White House Bureau Chief for the Washington Post. Frank Figluzzi, former FBI Assistant Director for Counterintelligence, who in the past has worked for Mr. Robert Mueller. And Mika Oyang, veteran Washington attorney, former staffer for the House Intel and Armed Service Committees. Good evening and welcome to you both. Frank, uh, you have run Intel, I have not, but then I ran across this sentence in their prepared report tonight, and this gets your attention, makes you want to check the calendar that it's not 1969. China and Russia are more aligned than at any point since the mid-1950s, and the relationship is likely to strengthen in the coming year as some of their interests and threat perceptions converge. Again, given your experience in the job, Frank, what stood out to you today most? As someone who has actually helped draft the counterintelligence portion of these reports in past years, that phrase jumped off the page at me, Brian. The notion that our number one and number two adversaries, China and Russia, are now collaborating more than they have in half a century working together against us was very, very sobering for me. Those combined forces are are a major threat to the united states when they train together when they do ops together when they align their strategies and objectives together we're going to get a double-barreled approach toward the united states and the west during a time when perhaps we have the most ill-equipped president from a receptivity wise to the intelligence community ever in our history um, that is significant and the, the testimony today from our intelligence chiefs presented more than ever before the disparity, the growing disparity between the ground truth that they presented and the planet that this president lives on. And it, it begs the question, Brian, is this a president who not only is part of an unstable world at an unstable time, but is he rather contributing to the instability of the world because of his choice to ignore the intel from the career professionals. Uh, Mika, please help to explain this disconnect to the folks watching tonight. You've been in your share of Washington briefings. Would the president not be briefed, given a copy of at least their written testimony, have it read to him, uh, have it conveyed to, to him in some way? Not that that would explain the disconnect. No, it doesn't explain the disconnect. And it is actually quite troubling because this assessment that we saw today is the sum summary of all the intelligence reporting that the community is producing all the time every day and the president's daily brief should reflect all of these judgments all the time so at this point all the senior administration officials have heard this on multiple occasions and so not agreeing with these conclusions is willful disregard of the facts as the intelligence community has been gathering them for at, over the past year and really since the start of this administration and Phil Rucker, think of the coverage uh, newspaper business and the television business gave this president's Oval Office address. You'll yeah. recall we all build it correctly as his first use of the backdrop, the power of the Oval Office for a nationwide address. We covered it or tried to straight down the middle. That topic, the national emergency we were facing as a people, nowhere to be found on the list of their top security priorities today. 
That's right, Brian. And it goes beyond that one night in the Oval Office. For the last 40-odd days, President Trump has only been talking about one crisis, and that's the crisis that he uh, sees at the, at the southern border uh, with illegal immigration. And yet we heard today from the intelligence professionals, from the people that President Trump himself appointed uh, to lead our nation's intelligence agencies, that there are much greater crises elsewhere, that there's a crisis in North Korea, that there's a crisis in Syria still with ISIS, that there's a crisis uh, with Iran, and that there's a real growing crisis with with China and Russia uh, perhaps converging uh, to really do danger and, and harm to our country. And President Trump has not spoken about any of that. We've heard over and over and over again about the security and humanitarian crisis with Mexico, about the rapes, about the murders, about the, the people who are coming over, the drug lords that are, are, are bringing narcotics over the border. But we've not heard him focusing on those other global threats. And indeed, he's been talking a lot lately about how great the relationship is between him and Kim Jong-un in North Korea, talking about how North Korea's no longer pursuing nuclear weapons, that they are no longer a nuclear threat. And that is simply not true based on the intelligence assessments that we heard today in Congress.